Hey, 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 it's Rebecca, and you are listening to Resilient by Design. Today, my podcast guest is Lisa Simone Richards. She is a PR and visibility strategist. And what I love about Lisa, not only that she's from Toronto, um, but is that she talks about getting visible and how you can do it yourself. And some really key key points. And there's some really funny things that come up that Lisa shares that resonate with me on a very deep level. And I talk about that in the podcast. Hello, JTT. If you know, know what I'm talking about, listen to the episode. Um, no, but seriously, Lisa talks about, you know, why you want to have a healthy mixed media or a media mix so that people can consume your content according to their preference, right? Reading, listening, and watching. She also talks about ways to get free exposure and the ABCs of visibility. I love her ABC um, categorizing, getting visible in three categories. And it really was very powerful for me because I've noticed where I have excelled in certain areas, one of the letters you'll find out in the episode, and where maybe I haven't excelled in the others. So I think you guys will really enjoy this episode. If you're looking to get your business or yourself noticed and visible, then this episode is for you. Enjoy my conversation with Lisa. All right. (laughs) I'm Rebecca Hay, and I've built a successful interior design business by trial and error, podcasts, online courses, and so many freaking books. Over the last decade, I've grown from an insecure student to having false starts to careers, and now I'm finally in the place where I want to be. Throughout my journey, it's been pretty obvious that I'm passionate about business and helping other entrepreneurs do the same. Each week, I'll share tangible takeaways from my own experience and the experiences of other badass women to help you build your confidence and change your business. Welcome to the podcast, Lisa. I'm so excited to have this conversation, Rebecca. As a fan of the show and a fan of yours, this is going to be a lot of fun to share with your audience today. I'm super excited because I think this conversation is coming at the perfect time for designers. But before we dive into the juicy goodness, do you want to just share with my audience uh, who you are, what you're all about? Sure. Hello to you listening. My name is Lisa Simone Richards. I'm a PR and visibility strategist, and primarily I work with online service-based business owners who want to get more visibility and exposure. So the way that I show, I help them do that is through leveraging other people's platforms. I'm a huge believer that there is somebody out there who's already got a group of your ideal clients hanging out, whether that's listening to a podcast, watching a television show, logging onto a website. And all we need to do is figure out who's the person that already has your crowd hanging out there. How do we figure out how to get an in with them and offer some value so we can get exposure to that audience in a way that doesn't cost us money? So I love sharing with entrepreneurs, here's how you get PR and visibility, something that maybe sounds a little far off to them, like, oh, I have to hire a fancy publicist to be able to do that. And the truth is, no, you just need to have a really good idea that brings value to an audience, figure out who the gatekeeper is to give you access, and boom, it's that easy to get exposure. Well, I love this. And I mean, I, you know, that I've talked about this on the podcast a little bit about getting published and working, working with a publicist. And we haven't really talked so much about that angle of how you can kind of do it yourself or DIY it. So I'm excited to dive into that. How did you end up doing this? It's funny. Okay. There are two specific moments in my life when I remember being interested in getting into PR. The first one was, I must've been around 11 years old and I had a subscription to Teen People magazine and I saw the letter to the editor section. I was like, how cool is it that you can write in a letter, a letter, sorry, hit send, and then you see it in print. So I knew where the stamps were, the envelopes and everything, went into mom's cupboard, wrote a letter, mailed it off. And a few months later, when my issue came in the mail, it had Jonathan Taylor Thomas from Home Improvement on the cover he was wearing oh my god full stop for one second Uh uh-huh obsessed with jtt jtt was like i was gonna marry jtt i love oh no i was gonna marry you know who he is oh my god that was our era (laughs) exactly and the funny thing is you're in a red shirt today as we're recording and i can see the cover it was a turquoise background with jtt and a red t-shirt and i opened it up and i saw my name in print and i saw my letter to the editor and i thought that was the coolest thing ever so that was the beginning of lisa's interest in media and then fast forward a few years to first year university i went to western university in london and i was having lunch with a girl who was in fourth year and about to graduate and she shared with me that she was coming back to toronto to go to humber for pr school now this is 2002 
Sex in the City was in its heyday. Samantha Jones made PR look super sexy and fun. And I was like, totally. yeah, fashion, beauty, exclusivity, parties. I am into that. So since 18 years old, I was volunteering on student council in my sorority for the Infusion Fashion Show, learning all the things PR while I was still in school. Um, by the time I went to the same PR school that she did, I was interning at a beauty company, forced and bullied my way into an inter- internship there. And they hired me on, ended up working Fashion Week a few times, Fashion Beauty agents working um, Toronto International Film Festival with celebs coming in to get jewelry. Um, fast forward, I moved into agency where I worked with corporate clients like Staples, Crayola, um, Diageo, Virgin Mobile. And really after that agency job, I started working at a small business. So it was a local boot camp. They had 30 locations in Ontario. And over the course of four years, I helped them grow to over 100 locations across the country and 10x the revenues from 400,000 a year to over 4 million a year. And that's when I really saw the power of PR and visibility. And I was like, man, how cool would it be if small business owners could get access to knowing how to do this? So they wouldn't hear, oh, you have to go to a PR agency where it's, you know, like five to $10,000 a month and you just sign a one-year contract. A lot of people don't have access to that. So I made it my mission to see, can I teach people how to do everything I've learned in the last 20-ish years or so? And it's so fun to look back at my first client, uh, Jessie Lane, Lee, a nutritionist who I haven't worked with since 2015. And she's still getting on morning TV shows shows regularly because she learned how to do it. So it's really cool to bless people with a gift that they can use over and over again in their business. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love your story. Wow. You've done a lot, lady. Like it's funny, amazing. like trying to compress it into two minutes. Yeah. It always sounds like a lot, I suppose, when you compress it, but it still is a lot. It's pretty amazing. And I can see how your experience, cause it's quite like, it's quite varied, right? You've got the corporate experience. You've got all of that. But I do, I have to say, I really relate to your <laughs> Jonathan Taylor Thomas team. Was it Team Beat magazine or whatever? Oh my God, Tiger Beat, Team Beat. I had all, those all of them, my walls. Because I feel like those were, when I, was a, when I was a teenager, those magazines, or maybe realized like, I wanted to be in magazines. I wanted to like, there, it was very aspirational. It's so funny that we have that similar experience. Um, okay, so obviously, if you're listening to this podcast right now, you are keen to get more visibility, right? So we're, we've got designers listening, we've got stagers, we've got some architects, um, some decorators, just some entrepreneurs, a lot of creative entrepreneurs listening, who know that they need to get, that's, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say published, but that's not necessarily the only thing. I think it's interesting because designers, we tend to really fixate on magazine publications. We can have that conversation too about the value of it, but um, because there's something about seeing our work praised in the glossy pages of a magazine. Um, And I know for me, when I first started working with a publicist, that was my goal, like get in a magazine, magazine, magazine. Um, But what I, I do think is now, and why I said I think this conversation is more important now than ever, as much as I know designers want to get published and all of that, designers need to get in front of their audience because when times are slower, because we live in an industry where there can be peaks and valleys, where we get really busy. And so we kind of fall off the networking, the marketing, the promoting our services, and then our jobs wrap up. And shoot, where's the next job coming from? And no more is that, you know, really relevant than right now. We're on the cusp of, if you're listening to this in real time, this is, you know, midway through 2022, we're on the cusp of what everyone's saying is a recession that's coming. And so when there's that fear of an economic slowdown, I think immediately there's an opportunity for people to really focus on leveraging what they've got to try and get in front of more people, right? There, there is going to be a push um, where marketing is going to be really important because you want to keep your business alive and keep your business afloat. And if anything, you want it to thrive in these economic hard times and grow. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And I think one of the things I even want to touch on before we go further is really getting clear on the distinction between content and visibility, because I think this is where a lot of people get mixed up. And it sounds like your audience is probably a little bit aware of the distinction between the two, but just in case anyone isn't, you know, something that I see so much right now is that people, they need exposure. They want to reach more of their ideal clients. So they're focused on publishing more content on their blog, more content on their Instagram account. And the truth is that's creating content, which nurtures the people who 
already follow you, who are already in your ecosystem, it's not necessarily going to attract in new leads. Although we're seeing if you do something like a reel, that's going to grow an influx of followers a little more quickly. So what I want people to really think about is how do I get visibility to reach new people and not just continue to show up on my existing platforms? And, you know, when I think about traditional PR 20 years ago, that was getting on a TV show that was being published in Style at Home magazine. Um, But now it could be doing an Instagram live with somebody else. It could be going live in someone else's Facebook account. Maybe it's doing a guest appearance in somebody else's mastermind. So there are a lot of creative ways that, again, we can still apply that idea of leveraging other people's platforms. Yeah, this is something I love that you want to talk about this because I want to learn from you because it's something that I've seen other people do very successfully, but I will be completely honest with you. And this is why I've hired publicists in the past is I would prefer somebody else advocate for me and sell me. I struggle with, it's one thing to sell now our design business. I'm more comfortable with that. I can talk about the interior design aspect, but especially when it comes to my own coaching business, I, even in the design world too, I would say, I've always kind of shied away. And I think probably other, you know, women who are listening can relate. I've shied away from like reaching out to the people, probably because I have my own deep rooted fear of rejection. And so there's so much opportunity and I know it's out there to grow, whether it's my interior design business um, and leveraging and getting in front of like higher end clients or it's getting in front of more designers who I can help with my programs. It's it's scary to reach out. I mean, I don't know what that looks like in your in your what what you teach, but I've seen from the you know the publicists who reach out to me to get on the podcast to get someone on the podcast, or from who I've worked with. It's a lot of follow up. Um, it's more follow up, and then another follow up, and and sometimes being relentless, but in a very polite way. And I just. It, that doesn't come naturally to me. So for me, it's really dependent on the platform. So I'm not a cookie cutter person who's going to say everyone should be on TV and magazines. Like I really need to understand who's the person in front of me. Where's your comfort level? Where are your strengths? I'm an only child. Throw me on stage in front of 3000 people and I will dance across the stage and be like, hey, everyone put down your phones. Let's all pay attention to me. That's (laughs) other people's nightmare. So it's really a matter of being clear on where someone's personal strengths line, but also getting clear on what are the goals for the business. So, um, you know, when it comes to podcasts, for example, I will never pitch a client for a podcast. Um, I find podcast hosts like this is their platform. They've grown this audience. They've poured, poured their heart and soul into it. And then when a publicist comes along, they're like, my client written this book and they could be on your show. I find podcast hosts get their backup. They're like, oh, so you just want to use my podcast. So typically actually for my clients, I'll write the pitch for them. I'll find the shows and the email address, but I have them hit send. So nobody ever knows that I exist. However, when it comes to more traditional platforms like television and magazines, there's a certain cachet to having somebody represent you. So it's, it's great to have a publicist in that sense. But when it comes to the whole DIY perspective and the fear of putting yourself out there and the fear of rejection, and Hey, I've been doing this for 20 years. I get rejected all the time. It just rolls off my back now. Um, A a little shift in perspective that I like to have is taking the focus off of me and where I might feel uncomfortable or have that unworthiness complex come up because, hey, it still pops up every now and then and I have to put it at bay. But what I really like to lean into thinking about is who is the person on the other side that needs to hear my message? Like if there is somebody out there who just isn't as good as me, isn't as dedicated as me, doesn't care about their clients as much as I do, but somebody else is a better marketer than I am, my clients might make the wrong decision and hire them and end up wasting their money, having a negative experience and not getting the result. So a lot of the time I think about who am I here to impact and how am I doing a disservice by staying small and being quiet and letting people fall into the wrong hands when I know I can do a better job for them. So a lot of the time when that fear comes up and it comes up for everybody, nobody is alone in that, but it's having that conversation of who needs to hear my message today and let me get over myself, not in that aggressive a way, but you know, let me move past myself and be in service to the people who need to hear my message. Oh my God. That is, that really resonates with me. That's so powerful. You're so right. I have had designers in my programs who say to me, Rebecca, this is so much more valuable than the A to Z program that I did with such and such a person who I personally know is very good at marketing their program, but the actual takeaway for the designer was not as strong or someone who said, Oh, I just invested in this other person's thing. I really regret it. I wish I had done power of process or I really want to be in designers. Like there's so much of that. And just because someone's really good and flashy at marketing doesn't mean that they provide the value. It's remembering the value that we provide to our clients. 
Absolutely. I was actually on a call with um, the mastermind I'm a part of, and uh, I was listening to another group member and she was sharing how she just paid a podcasting agency, something like $11,000 to help her book shows. And she'd gotten on like maybe five or six shows and had zero results. And they're hearing me listen in the background. They know what I do. So the coach is like, Lisa, you got any opinions? I'm like, oh, I have 20 opinions on this. Um, (laughs) I almost hired one of those agencies, by the way. I'm like, yes, I got to get on podcasts. But then I realized there's not that many podcasts in my space. So why would I spend all this money to get on 50 podcasts and spend all that time if I'm not in front of that's so they're expensive, these agencies now. But it was just so heartbreaking to hear, like, I could listen to this woman talk on our call for five minutes. And I was like, okay, your call to action is a 90 minute webinar. No one who's listened to you talk for 30 minutes has 90 minutes to spare to watch this. Your call to action is all wrong. And you've paid someone $11,000 and they haven't figured that out. And I heard it in a five minute phone call. Like that moment made me realize, damn, I'm being lazy. I need to put myself out there, like not to devalue <laughs> my work, but my mentorship is half that cost. And you'll know how to bet on podcasts and television and magazines and everything at the end of it. Like it broke my heart that she just flushed 11 grand down the toilet for nothing. I'm like, cool. This means you get to get over yourself and be out there in a bigger way. So people know the work that you do. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. So I want to talk, I want to dive into a little bit more about this because this is always a hot topic with designers is this idea of having a healthy mix of media of exposure. Right. And, and, um, and then in a minute we could talk maybe a little bit more of like the ways that people can get free exposures. I know you're really gifted at sharing that information, but I I think it's important to have this conversation because designers are like, I want to get in the glossy pages of house and home magazine or architectural digest. There's more to life and exposure than just a magazine. Right. And I'm curious your thoughts on that, because I know a lot of designers who still don't value um, getting published online. They don't really value a lot of the other ways. So maybe talk about the ways and the mix. And what are your thoughts on that sort of more traditional approach? Okay, so I'll definitely dive into the healthy media mix in two seconds, but I'd love to even start off by really rooting into intention before we ever pursue visibility and exposure in any way, shape or form. Let's get crystal clear on what is the purpose of exposure because we're all running businesses. It's super cute to be in a magazine, but it's got to have an ROI on us. So um, when I'm thinking about the intention, before we even figure out what publication makes sense, I go into the ABCs of visibility. And what these are is, um, again, the attention for getting seen. So A stands for awareness. This is when you need your ideal client to know that you actually exist. And I'll use a fitness example versus a design example, but by way of having fitness experience, I have a lot of personal trainers come to me or studio owners and they're like, Lisa, I want to get in like muscle and fitness, oxygen, strong, like all those hardcore magazines. And I work with women who are going to the gym for the first time. And I have to be like, okay, well, guess what they're not reading? Oxygen, strong, muscle and fitness. You need to go for something softer, like a shape or a self or a chatelaine if you're here in Canada. So awareness is really thinking about where is my ideal client paying attention? Not necessarily where I like, but where can they find me? So that's what A stands for. B stands for buzz. A lot of the time, if we have something that we're about to launch or embark on, we need people to know about it and hearing about it just once isn't enough. So I always think about this as when a movie's coming out. You didn't just hear the movies coming out once. You're seeing billboards all over the place. The actors are on podcasts. Someone's in a new relationship. Somebody broke up. You're just hearing about it all over the place. And it's hitting you across the head that you're just like, I've heard about this in so many places. Like, maybe I should check it out. So for a, a designer, maybe you want to be published in a bunch of magazines at once, or you want to be on a bunch of podcasts all in a condensed amount of time so that you're essentially hitting people over the head a bunch of times and they realize, okay, I got to pay attention to this. Then finally, you have C, which stands for credit. Credibility. Now, this is when you're not necessarily looking for the um, someone who's going to hire you next, but you really want to establish yourself as an authority, create that expert status for yourself, have your name in the same sentences as the people that you've looked up to as you're coming up in the industry. So this is when you might be maybe looking at a trade publication, but you want to get those logos that you can put it on your website. People don't even care what the article is. It's just like, oh my God, they've been in Forbes. Like no one cares what the article is. It's just, you've been in Forbes, you've arrived. So really getting clear first on whether you're looking to create awareness, buzz or credibility is going to make sure you're paying attention to the right platforms first and foremost. Otherwise we could be getting visibility with the wrong end goal in mind and then being like, oh, that didn't work. So it's not that one comes before the other necessarily. 
No, it just depends on what stage, what's your priority in business right now? Am I yeah. trying to establish my brand further? Am I trying to get more clients? Am I looking to fill my pipeline for an upcoming service launch I have? So just being really clear on what is the purpose of the PR first, that's going to inform your strategy from there. I think that's really powerful. I mean, that's that really hits home for me because I've said so many times, I'm like, I don't like, I don't want to sound, I don't want this to come across bad, but I've been published a ton for my interior design work. And I've said to my team, like, I feel like I don't need to keep getting published at this point. Um, I, I feel like I've got enough logos, right? We've got lots of press. There's another layer that is what I need for my interior design business. And not to say that I don't want to get breast press in the future. So you don't want it to be dated, but I think that's so interesting. It's like, I'm getting the credibility, credibility, credibility. Okay. I am credible as an interior designer. Now what? Right. And focusing on one of those other two. That's so interesting. I think intention too um, is understanding, and, and this is sort of, an internal investigation for a business owner, but is understanding like what your business is about. Yes, you need to know your ideal client and where they're at. And I love that example where you're right. If somebody's going to go to a gym, like if for me, if I need to figure out what gym I want to go to or what, I don't know, bodybuilding program or whatever it might be, I'm probably not going to pick up one of those magazines. You're right. I'll see an ad in an interior design magazine, possibly, or in the newspaper or wherever I am. And I say that to designers a lot too, because we want to get into these prestigious interior design publications. Is the purpose credibility to your point? Then yes, go for it all the way. But if the purpose isn't getting front of awareness and getting in front of your client, I can tell you firsthand that most of my ideal clients do not read design magazines. That's why they're hiring me. They're not even interested. They just want to give me the money so I can do the thing. So I think that's a really, really interesting point, Lisa, that you need to understand your intention and understand your business, right? And so when you are going to get published, what do you stand for? What is your company about? What do you want to be known for? And that was something in the last year when I, I joined forces with another, a different PR agency than I had in the past. I went into it this time around. I've, I've recorded this on a podcast. I don't have to dive into that, but with more intention of, I want to be known for this. Mm -hmm. Whereas before I was like, I just want to get published. I don't know. Let's just see. Oh, this is so fun and sexy. But this time around, I was, I was saying to the publicist, I'm like, listen, environment, the environment matters to me. I want to start to, to focus on that and share my knowledge and be known for someone who cares and makes sustainable choices with design. I also want to promote my coaching business. Like these were my two intentions. It was much more specific, which then get, got me more tangible results. Exactly. And it, it, again, being clear on that intention is everything. I remember one of my first private clients ever, Cassie Lambert, she was a fitness trainer as well. She just wanted to be in self. She read self magazine her whole life and just seeing her name in self was the end goal. She didn't care if she got clients from it. She was just like, it would be so cool to be in a magazine I've read my whole life. And she got in it and she was perfectly happy because she was clear on what the purpose was. Then when we went for other magazines like Oxygen, we knew we were filling her booty building program. So we pitched booty building workouts. So there was a connection there that people would continue to follow her for more. So it's so important to be crystal clear on what is the purpose? What do I want to get out of this? Because then you can make a focused plan rather than being like, oh, I did that and it just didn't work. Right. Well, like just throwing it all out there, seeing what sticks. Oh, oh, that's the thing that kills me with PR agencies. When I worked in PR agency, I always remember my manager, like this is the day of print stacks too. She came to my desk with like a stack of Excel sheets, like pitch all these media and just throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. And my approach is so different now. I'm very much like, you know, what are the top five publications or outlets that would make a huge difference for me? Okay, let's figure out who do we need to know there? What section do we need to be in? How do we cross something very specific to that outlet so that we get a yes? So some people will totally go with a pray and spray approach. And I'm very like, let's be laser specific on our goal of the outcome. <laughs> Pray and spray. I love it. <laughs> Here we go. I hope so. Fingers Best crossed. <laughs> okay. I love that. I love that. Being intentional and the ABCs, everyone listening, if you are driving, then you might want to re-listen to this episode to take notes and write all of this down. I'm just saying I'm taking notes. <laughs> And then you were asking me originally about the media mix and I kind of shifted from there. So I'm happy right. to come back to that. Well, you're right. Cause this totally ties into the where, 
Yeah, of course. So one of the things to really remember is like when I'm thinking about marketing my business or whatever it might be, I have to put on my consumer hat because we have to remember people are looking at us from that lens as well. So when people are consuming content, they typically have one of three preferred ways to digest it. They like to watch it, they like to listen to it, or they like to read it. And a fun story that I often tell is my husband and I, we love to cook together. And a recipe that we make maybe every other month or so is a Thai red curry. And we don't know it so well that it's off the back of our hand. I always like to turn on the video on YouTube, play it, pause it, do the thing that she just did, play it again, and keep going through the recipe. Now, like four or five times later, my husband's like, I can't stand her accent. Can we like read a blog post about how to do this instead? (laughs) So again, we want the same goal at the end of the day, a really delicious Thai red curry for dinner, but we have different ways of wanting to get there. So I like to remind my clients, your ideal client is the same way. So how can we get in front of them in a way that they can hear us, that they can see us and that they can read about us? So this is where my ladder of publicity comes into play. So picture you have a ladder with three rungs on it. And, you know, at the bottom rung, getting started, you know, as we're starting to put ourselves out there, think about this being written content. So how people can read about you. Um, Is this writing an article for a publication? You know, is it simple as going on Google and typing in write for us interior design? You'll get some sites that are looking for contributors, may not be the biggest, sexiest titles, but if you're getting started, there you go. It's just handed you a bunch of places that instead of writing a blog post on your own website, now you can contribute somewhere else. You'll show up in Google results. You can put that logo on your website. Um, So you can either write an article for someone else or you can pitch a story and they will write it and interview you to get a quote if you're not the person who likes to do writing. So that could be guest blog posts, that could be newspapers, that could be print magazines, that could be digital magazines because we know that they've got their online arm as well. Um, So those are a few different ways that you can have people reading about you. And I think that's a really good place for a lot of people to start, especially when that imposter complex is coming up, because when you write content, you can put it away and come back 24 hours later to edit it. You can give it to somebody else to take a look at, like you can hit enter and send on that when you really feel confident on it. So I think that that's a really good way to start with visibility without putting yourself too much on the spot. Moving up from written content, now we can move into being heard. Does that mean, you know, especially if you're a bricks and mortar business and you only work with hyper local people, radio is not that sexy, but guess what? It gets in front of the people who have the power to take out their credit cards and hire you. So maybe radio is a good strategy if you're specifically working with people in your radius. Um, Alternatively, if you're doing digital work and you can work with anyone anywhere, maybe getting on podcasts is the right move. Maybe, um, hosting or moderating groups on Clubhouse can be another way to do it. And a lot of the time with audio content, you're not necessarily being seen. So here's a great opportunity to just have a conversation, work on that messaging, takes a little bit of the pressure off. And I know that anyone listening to the show has had a successful conversation before. So it's just a matter of doing it again and really getting honed in on that messaging. Then moving up to the top tier of the ladder, which is visibility and literally being seen, which is my favorite because it's the fastest way to create that no like, and trust factor. So again, 20 years ago, getting seen meant either speaking on stage at a conference or being on a like, you know, city line or breakfast television or the Maryland Dennis show or something like that. And now this has expanded so much. You could be on a virtual summit. You could be doing a live in someone else's Facebook group, a live up with somebody else on Instagram. I keep harping somebody else because the whole purpose is to leverage other people's platforms and get in front of new people rather than doing a live in your own group, rather than doing a live on your own Instagram where you're just getting in front of a handful of your existing followers. So how can we cross promote with other people and get seen on their platforms? So the bottom is being read read about, next level up is being heard, next level up is being seen. And if you can get at least one of each of those three, no matter how your ideal client likes to consume information, they're able to get it from you. Plus when someone searches you, it's like, oh, they don't just show up on their own platforms. They're on all these other sites. Like they must know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Totally. Totally. I like that. Would you say that, that, um, I'm trying to think of an example what would would something fall under this like okay maybe you do a podcast like you guest on a podcast or maybe you do a live event or you're a speaker or whatever can you take that same content and turn that into written content and then yeah i mean there are a lot of people There are a lot of people who talk about repurposing content, and I think that's a really smart thing to do. Actually, I had a call with somebody yesterday, and we were just talking about how can you take the content you've already put effort into and find other ways to use it? Because I'm a publicist. I love doing this stuff all day, every day. 
you're a business owner. This is just an aspect of your business and you don't want to be doing this stuff all day. So how can we be as smart as possible about it? And, you know, I think one of the best ways if you want to use that content repurposing strategy is just start off with doing visual content because then you've got the video. Then you can pull the audio using like otter.ai or whatever it is and turn that into an audio file. You can send even like a two minute snipping to your clients in an email. Pocket coaching is one of my clients calls it. Send them an audio message. You can take that content and have it transcribed and have that turn into an email or a blog post. So definitely starting, I, one strategy that my coach teaches that I love is just having a weekly live show, whether that's on Instagram, Facebook, wherever it might be, just letting people have, get into that habit of seeing you on a certain day and time in a certain place. So, you know, like our favorite episode, Westworld for me, Sunday, 9 p.m. It's consistent. Um, so, you know, creating that consistency with our audiences and then you can pull from that and turn it into other types of content for your people. Yeah, I love that. I think that's certainly... For a lot of us who are trying to create content, whether it's on Instagram or doing a video, there's so much opportunity to take something like you're teaching about, I don't know, mixing colors in a room. It's the same information, but you can share it in so many ways. But I I really do love the idea. And I'm not really in this habit. We had always planned on like, oh, well, we have... Well, we have video from the podcast and then we're going to put it on YouTube. And like, it's just, it's the bandwidth is our challenge is having the bandwidth to do the editing, to do the thing, to get it out there. But I love that idea of like doing the live show or what have you, and then taking it, transcribing it. Like we've transcribed all our podcasts, but I haven't even turned it into a blog post yet. Like there's so much great information, in all these podcasts, like there's so much opportunity that I know is there um, that maybe just takes a little bit of strategy, right? And having that intention, like you say, and planning it and, and sort of knowing, because it can be overwhelming. I think that, sure. like if there's a designer listening right now, they're like, okay, Rebecca, that is a lot of things. And Lisa's ideas are great, but like, where do I start? So what do you say to someone who's feeling like audio, visual, written, it's so overwhelming. I just want to get seen. Oh man, I would number one start. If we're talking about our own platforms, I would start with having that weekly live show that just requires 10 to 15 minutes of your time, then hopping over onto Fiverr, Upwork, one of those sites and finding somebody who specializes in repurposing content. Let them create audiograms for you over an existing picture that you've got that can go on stories. So, you know, find a way that it's only 10 to 15 minutes of your time, outsource the rest. I love that. I love that. That's such a great idea. There's a lot of people out there looking to help you part-time. It doesn't have to be a full-time assistant to help do that stuff. That's such. And it's even almost probably better to find someone who's doing it part-time for a number of people because they know this ins and outs. They're doing it all day. So, you know, as long as you just highlight, you know, I said something really good at minute two and minute six, like turn that into something. They're at it. And I think what I found, especially with training my team um, that I work with on Upwork is, you know, for for me, I think we had a month of going back and forth every week on, you know, this isn't quite right. That's not quite right. Shifted to this. And now we don't even have conversations. It's just automatic getting everything done. So maybe it took about four weeks of the warm up process, but now it just happens on the back end. So I think it's one of those critical things that future you is going to be so grateful that you took the 10 or 15 minutes to do that. Totally. Yeah. And I, that's something that I haven't done. Like we, it's just me and Vera doing all the things and our time is, is limited, right? We are two people, like you say, I'm the business owner. So I'm wearing all the hats. Um, I, I, you know, I, that, that's something I need to look into just for myself. I'm just like thinking right now, I'm like, this is good advice. I need to look into doing that. I gotta like, because here's what I'm finding is that especially on Instagram, which has always been my platform, it's not the same. And so like engagement is down. Um, it just feels different. And so right now I'm at this place and I'm, I'm looking to you for advice, but like, where are people at? Like everyone's kind of in this, it feels to me like we're all in this kind of shifting, figuring it out. I know people who are a little bit on TikTok. They're a little, they sometimes watch YouTube. They definitely listens to podcasts. A lot of our like designers definitely listen to podcasts, but it kind of feels like people are everywhere. Is that sort of the intention behind having a media mix and that people aren't just consuming one platform anymore? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Okay. So here's a truth on that one. Everything works. There's somebody who successfully built their business using Pinterest. Someone successfully built their business using YouTube. Someone successfully built their business using Instagram or TikTok. All of them probably do work. 
We don't have time to do them all. That's overwhelming. So I would recommend what are two platforms that you can commit to owning and being consistent on? It's, you know what? I love scrolling through Instagram. I love watching people's content. I could be bothered to walk around and talk to a camera and put content out there. When I got married last September, there is no Lisa posting all day, every day about her wedding. It was just my friends posted stuff. I reposted it. So I know for me, it's just not authentic that I'm going to spend all day dancing and singing on Instagram to get clients. I know it works. That's how I found the makeup artist for my wedding. That's how I found the hairdresser for my wedding, but it's not authentic to me and I'm not going to do it. I've started and stopped and started and stopped. So I've realized I love having conversations. I'm great at going on podcasts and guesting, and I'm looking at launching my own. I very much enjoy um, going live in my Facebook group, emailing my list. So that's what I stick to consistently because that's what works for me. And that's what I know I can do. So I think we get to be honest with ourselves. What does feel good to me that I can actually commit to doing versus, okay, I should be doing all three of these things, but realistically, I'll only end up doing one and then I'll beat myself up for not doing the other two. Like let's set ourselves up to win. Yeah. I like that advice. That's so, so smart because there can be a little bit of like squirrel syndrome, like, Ooh, let's try this sure. now. And then you're back and forth. And then you're not, you're, you're, you're spreading yourself so thin that you're not actually putting your resources into anything to make any difference. And here's one of the things that I'm really passionate about sharing with people. And one of the things I love about my industry, because it was very interesting as social media was on the upswing. I was looking at my career in PR and I was like, am I still relevant? Like mm -hmm. I'm a publicist who does not have cable. I haven't bought a magazine in years, but what's really cool is the work that I've been doing for 20 years hasn't changed. The principles stay the same. The platforms have shifted. And what we all do need to be very cognizant of is platforms change and evolve. Remember Vine? Remember Periscope? Like those don't exist anymore. Oh my anymore. gosh, Periscope. Everyone was uh -huh. like, that's going to be the next great thing. And it was like, plop. Yep. Club, like, I mean, Clubhouse. Everyone was Clubhouse in 2020, 2021. And where is it is now? It still, it's on, people still do it? Is it still some people still do it and go hard on it. But, uh, you know, it's right. large, it was huge for a minute when it was exclusive and it was and or was Apple only because I'm Android. So I was sitting on the outside right. of that one. But as soon as it opened to everyone, wow. it kind of diminished. So yeah. I think it's really important for people to not just focus on how do I use TikTok? How do I use Pinterest? Because guess what? One day it'll go away. So focus on how do I learn the skill that'll translate from platform to platform to platform so I can lather and rinse and repeat that strategy in different ways, but the same thing. And you could do that for the life cycle of your business. I love that. I love that. Okay. So how can designers start getting media opportunities? Like what can they do to start getting those opportunities if they are, you know, trying to do it themselves? You know what? I think it would, for me, I would, if someone asked, you know, if a client was asking me that question, I'd first, number one, ask them again, what's the intention? Are we looking to build awareness, buzz, or credibility? I would check in with my ideal clients because I think there's a thing, especially in online business, where we're in our heads all day. Like, my ideal client is Jane, who has three kids and drives this car. Like, just, just stop thinking about it in your head. Go talk to your favorite client that you've worked with, somebody that you know would be an amazing client, and say, hey, when you're looking for information on the content that, you know, my industry, where are you getting it from? And ask them and hear, oh, I'm listening to this podcast. I follow this influencer. That's going to be a great lead for you to know, okay, I'm going to find more people just like them there. That's a good place for me to get started. Um, and then once you're really clear on what is the platform, the place that I want to show up in, my strategy is to really start building that relationship with that person, the gatekeeper who has access. Um, whether it's, you know, a podcast that I want to be on and I start liking their comments or commenting and engaging on their stuff. Maybe I leave a rating and a, re a rating and a review. And when I send a pitch, I send a screen grab of that rating and review. Because you know what? Even if I'm not a fit for the show... You can't really just hit delete on that. Someone will respond. Um, so I like to be pretty laser. Where's the place that's going to make the biggest difference for me? Who do I need to know? And how do I start like getting an in with this person? Um, when I work with larger clients who are looking to hire me for the done for you aspect, a lot of people will be like, so tell me about your relationships. I'm like, listen, relationships are absolutely fantastic. I love when I can just text Janine at breakfast television and be like, hey, I have an idea for this segment. She'll be like, cool, Wednesday at seven. Great. That's awesome. It's nice when it's that chill, but you can create a relationship with any Anybody you need to. Yeah, it is a lot of relationships, but you're right. You can like you can make new relationships every day. Yeah, I was just this podcast. I've met so many great people that I did not know previously that I've built relationships with that are, that are like, I don't know, they're collaborating with me or we're just in touch. And I know that then after I've done the podcast, I can reach out to them or they reach out to me. And it's it's kind of the beauty of life, right? You're always meeting new people, you're establishing yourself, making new friendships, relationships. 
Yeah, even if I can share one of my own strategies that I've been using in 2022 to make it seem a little more simple for the person who's listening to this. Um, like I said, I know that I shine on podcasts and I love delivering uh, value on a podcast and I love opening people's eyes to possibility that they didn't know where they thought they had to hire a publicist, but then they can learn the strategy instead. So for me, uh, for the first half of my, the year, I went like super ham on going on podcasts. I was pitching 10 podcasts every week, which turned into, I think maybe if I averaged 11 or 12 podcasts a month. Let's say oh, between January and June, I ended up on something like 75 shows. That's 75 audiences I got access to. But beyond that, think about the relationship capital with those various podcast hosts that I've been introduced to who have said, hey, I know someone else whose show you could be on or who've been generous enough to promote an upcoming workshop that I have. Some of them I've done joint venture webinars with now, you know, where we combine and sell a product together. So it's not only a great way to get yourself out there, but to create referral partners who you can work with further down the line as well. Yeah, I love that. It's so true. It's not just about getting in front of the audience. It's it's connecting with the host or with the person that you're going live with or whatever it is. For a number of my clients, like we'll be strategic about the pod. Like it's not just pitching a podcast to be on a podcast. It's like, ooh, I would love to have that host on my summit. Okay, great. So why don't we send them a specific pitch? We get in the door that way and then we build the relationship from there. Yeah, totally. Uh, I think podcasting, I think designers don't think about it as an opportunity to get in front of their audience. But I like how you said earlier that, you know, just ask your clients, where are they? What are they consuming? You know, it can be in a casual conversation because if you want other clients like those great people, maybe like for a while there, I was working with a lot of um, retirees earlier in my career. And I love working with them. They're the best because they, you know, they'd done it before. It wasn't their first rodeo. They valued the quality. They would pay for my service. And I noticed, and I was a little detective that they had Zoomer magazine on their coffee table. And so I turned to my publicist. I'm like, I need to get into Zoomer magazine. Who would ever think to want to be in a Zoomer magazine, right? But I realized those clients aren't picking up whatever magazine or they weren't listening to podcasts. But my now my clients who I have now, they listen to podcasts. They, they're on Instagram. They're on Pinterest or whatever it is that they're doing. So finding out where they are. And then I love the idea of leveraging other people's audiences. I love that. And I imagine that in order to do that, you need to go to that, um, to that other person and offer value. As Absolutely. To, hey, um, can you have me on your podcast or can you like, can you do a live with me? Like what's in it for them? Right. And that's absolutely the number one mistake that I see business owners make that they're making it all about themselves. I actually have a new client who I'm excited to start work with next week. And he shared with me, like, you know, here's some of the media stuff I've done in the past. And he sent me one of his pitch and I was like, Hey, this is my story. This is what I've done. These are my results. Would you like to have me on your show? I'm like, you gave them, I haven't said this to him, but you gave them nothing. You just talked about yourself all day. And I just, when I went to that PR school in Humber, I always remember my professor, Kaylee Morgan, in one of the first weeks of class said to us, nobody cares about your brand or business as much as you do. And I was like, that is rude. We just paid a lot of money to come here. And then I was like, you know what? That's the best line anyone could have told me in PR because people are so lovingly self-involved with their stories that they think they're interesting. And we have to remember it needs to be somebody who's built an audience wants to give their audience value. They're not looking to give you a free advertisement. You can pay for that if you just want to make it all about you. Mm -hmm. But the purpose of earned media is about really creating that value for somebody else. It's so interesting. It's no different than, you know, just talking to your ideal client. I say to designers all the time, and we talk about this in my course, Power of Process, which is more about process than marketing, but part of the process is understanding your ideal client. And we talk about the power of when you're posting and you're sharing information uh, with your clients, it needs to be about how you help them. They're the hero of the story, not about, hey, look at me. I'm really good at mixing color. Right? So one of the things one of the things I ask my clients to do whenever they're writing a pitch and getting ready to send it out or, you know, just pitch themselves for anything is before you hit send, scroll through the left margin of that page or of that email. How many sentences begin with I, me or my? 
And if they're all starting with I, me, or my, guess what? You made it all about you. And now we need to go back, edit, and shift. And it's not saying the content needs to change. Um, Again, I'm probably the worst person to have on calls in the mastermind group I'm a part of. Um, Someone, I'm going to use the example. I don't know where the tea sommelier example came from, but who knew there were tea sommeliers? Who knew the difference between like what type of tea and what to pair it with, like wine? And this person was saying, you know, they're sharing their pitch. And it's like, I'm a tea sommelier. And I can talk about like not burning your tea and this and that. And they're like, hey, Lisa, got any thoughts? I'm like, oh yeah, I got thoughts. Um, So I come off mute and I was like, you know, what if you just made the shift of saying your listeners love to curl up with a perfect cup of a pu'er tea while they're listening to your show. And I can share with them how not to burn it and get a really smooth, consistent flavor. We've said the exact same thing, but we started with your listeners versus me, me, me. I actually, I remember when I first started filming video for my business in 2016-ish, the videographer I work with shared with me, if you say you in the first five seconds of your video, people will watch it twice as long. Ooh, that's a good tip. Write that down, people. That's really good. Anytime I start a video now, I'm like, you're in the perfect place. You're here. I'm so excited. Not No, I don't want to say I'm so excited because no one cares that I'm excited, but it always right. starts with something about you. Good. You know, the fact that you, what you just said about reading an email and the first uh, letter, first set, letter of every sentence being the letter I, can I just tell you, I do that. I write an email and I pause and I look back when I, whether it's to a client or a vendor or someone I'm collaborating with. And I notice nine times out of 10, it's I, 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 cause I'm like, I'm really excited and I'm trying to show them that I care and that I'm invested in all the things. And I do that. I go back and I change the sentences. I intentionally, I've never heard anyone else do that, but me, I go back and I see, and here I am saying, I, 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 but I go back and I, I'm like, how can I rephrase this sentence to not start with it being about me? And there still will end up being one or two sentences that start with I, because it just comes naturally, but I actually do that. And it's something that I've never heard anyone else talk about. So interesting. It's, a, it's a, just like a tiny little tweak that you can make in your communication strategy with other people. Absolutely. And, you know, for some, and for someone who does this professionally, who I teach my clients, don't start with me, my, or I, I remember being on a call with somebody who's uh, asked, you know, we were talking about me coming into guest train in his mastermind. And I was sharing my podcast pitch philosophy and how not to start everything with I, me and mine. I had one on screen and he's like, you have six eyes there before you get to the other person. I was like, oh my God, I just got called out on my own stuff. <laughs> I wasn't mad about it. That was such powerful awareness. Thank you for highlighting that for me. And there are some shifts that I was able to make. So hopefully that's an example for everyone that we can grow and evolve and get fantastic feedback that just makes us stronger. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is such a good conversation, Lisa. I'm, 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 I'm saying I'm all the time now. And all I can think about is how I need for to self-conscious. It. <laughs> it's just like saying like as soon as you start paying attention to it, if you're someone who says it a lot, which I'm pretty sure I do, then you become very self-conscious of it. Uh, I, th- I think though that what you have to share is it's a really, um, it's a powerful message, I think, especially now. And this is how we started the conversation because I know that designers now are feeling a little bit that pressure that, okay, the economy is slowing. And if you have clients that are, clients that have heavily invested in the stock market that are, you know, high net worth clients that are, could stand to lose a lot. I don't know. Um, I know that we have had clients that have pulled back because of the economy and they've decided they're going to phase things out. So what that means is now we need to get in front of more people. We need to bring in more projects. We need to get back out there and not just rely on the word of mouth to help us grow our business. And I've always said this, and I'm curious what your thoughts are, Lisa, but um, it's powerful, I think, to say you can run a business based on word of mouth for sure. I think in order to grow a business, you need more than just word of mouth. Now, I think that's because we're in a different world than we were, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. Not to say it's not possible, but I think for a lot of designers, um, Getting in front of your clients in more creative ways is really powerful. For us, we have certainly seen clients come to us and we always ask what the referral source is. So whether it's in the intake, they fill it out, or I ask in the discovery call, I always say, oh, you know, I see that you said 
you you found us through a magazine. Which magazine was it? Or you know, maybe they didn't fill that out. And so I will ask, how did you, I'm just curious, you know, how did you hear about us? Because it's very useful information to start to catalog and see where your clients are coming from. And more, and what we've started to notice since we started doing this is that the clients that are coming to us for one reason, it's never just one touch point. It's, well, we saw you in Style at Home magazine, but my neighbor down the street knows someone who you did a renovation for. Or someone mentioned your name in the Facebook group, and I've been following you on Instagram for a while. So it's it's a bit of a trail. It's never just, it's rarely just one referral source. But also the power in capturing that information means that you can see which referral sources actually turn into the best projects and which referral sources are dead ends. And so sometimes what we've noticed is we get a lot of people coming to us because they follow us on Instagram, but really the people that move forward into the full-scale projects are maybe they follow us on Instagram, but that's not the primary referral source. And the people who've only found me on Instagram tend to not go past a discovery call because maybe they don't have the budget or the realistic expectations, or they're not truly committed to doing the design or whatever the reason might be. So being in multiple touch points and being multiple places in front of your client is the way that you are going to get in front and and that they are going to decide to hire you, I think. And the truth is like, there are so many options for our clients to choose from now that they're going to go down a rabbit hole and do their research before they take out their credit card. So even if they got a great referral from someone down the street or they've been following you on Instagram, chances are they're going to go to their good friend, Google, type in your name and see what comes up (laughs) before they pull out that credit card. Like, I'm not sure if you've ever watched a master of none on Netflix with Aziz Ansari, but I always remember there's one scene where he and his friend are going out for tacos and they're deciding on which taco place to go down. They're on Yelp. They're on Google. They're searching all these things for the best taco. And then by the time they leave to go, the place is closed. But like, even on like a $3 (laughs) spend for a taco, like people do their research. They want to find the best one that aligns with them, that has the best toppings, whatever it might be. So it's not enough that someone's going to hear your name. They are going to do your research. So why not create something that's going to do the work in the back end for you? I think that there's an opportunity for paid media. So, you know, Facebook ads and Google ads, uh, social media, the content that we're creating and earned media to all play well together. But the truth is with social media, a lot of that content disappears quickly. If you do a story, it's gone um, within 24 hours. Um, With paid media, you know, I can give Facebook a few thousand dollars to run some ads for me, but I have to remember no one logged on to Facebook today to be served up a bunch of ads and they know how to scroll past it. And also the second I turn off my ad spend, Facebook does not care about me. There is no remnants or any hint that I ever did something there. I'm gone. But when I invest 30 to 60 minutes having a conversation with somebody on a podcast, that episode lives on. I remember I, the episode that I found you from was back in February, you had recorded it, but I think I heard it maybe in the beginning of the summer or I pitched you maybe in the beginning of the summer. So we just have to remember that let's invest the time in creating content that will continue to live for us. Someone can search a topic and you will still come up. So it's, it's really smart to not only do the fast immediate things, but let's do the stuff that's going to live on and keep doing the work in the background for us for years to come. Absolutely. I love that advice. Okay. As we are coming to our time, I always like to ask every guest and I should probably tell you in advance. I, oh my God. I do this like with every, I don't know what I do. I'm just like, I'm here. Let's do a podcast at the end. I'm like, oh yeah, there's this thing. And then there's the other thing. And then like, so a last nugget of wisdom. I always ask if you can share a last nugget of wisdom, maybe it's extra emphasis on something we talked about, maybe it's something we didn't touch on, but what is a really great takeaway for the designers, decorators, entrepreneurs that are listening today? Yeah, I'll I'll share some really honest feedback about getting into the world of PR. My experience, even working with clients, doing it for myself, is that getting that first hit is going to be the hardest. You're going to send a pitch out. You're not going to get a response. It'll get deleted. You're going to feel disheartened. Don't stop there. The first pitch is the hardest. But once you get a feature, a media snowball starts to roll from there. Um, I had clients who are identical twin chiropractors here in Toronto, and we did a pitch for The Social, so a national daytime television show. They did a great job on that. Then all of a sudden, they were regular guest experts getting paid to be on. The producers from Canada AM at the time, it's now CT, I think it's now, what is it on? Your Morning, I think, is the new show. 
But in any event, back in the day, CTV had Canda AM. One of the producers was watching the social and was like, ooh, we should have the guys come on and do a segment about that. The guys go on Canda AM. A producer from 680 News, a local radio station here in Toronto, saw that segment, called the office, was like, we'd love to have the guys come on and talk about that on the radio. So be persistent to get that first hit of exposure, because then once people see you, it's not just consumers seeing you, it's other media people seeing you and being like, oh, that's a good idea. We should have them here. Another client who was dying to get, I had a 30-day accelerator program and she wanted TV and I got her breakfast television in just 30 days. And by the end of that segment, we heard the producer and Dina say on the side, she was really good. Let's talk to Tracy and the team about having her on City Line. And now she's a regular expert on City Line and she's done BT at least like eight to 12 times by now. So put in the effort to get that first hit. Everything gets easier from there. I love that. I love that. It's a snowball. You're right. It's about getting that momentum, getting it started. Such good advice. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Lisa, so much for joining me today. I feel like we barely scratched the surface. I feel like I could keep talking with you. Oh, there's so much more to go, but I hope it feels accessible and doable for people to start off with this on their own now and realize you don't have to have a million relationships. Just get clear on where does it make the biggest impact for me to be featured? Okay. Who do I need to know there? And then figure out how to approach them with value to get your foot in the door. Yeah. I love that. Where can everyone find you if they want to follow you and connect? So for anyone who's interested in getting on podcasts and they're like, I'm into this idea of just following that strategy, but I don't even know what to write. Cause I don't know about you, but I remember using Microsoft word back in the day and you'd open a document and that stupid little paper clip would pop up and bounce at you and be like, you don't know what to write. Um, was not a fan of him. So something I love to share with people is a copy of my own podcast pitch, the one that I have been using since August. So almost it's a one year anniversary that I use like over and over and over again. I haven't changed it in a year. So if anyone heads over to www.theperfectpodcastpitch.com, they can see word for word what I wrote to get featured on the content experiment with Abby Herman, who we then went on to do summits together and joint ventures together. And below the pitch, you're also going to get my fill in the blank template. So you'll have a prompt there, put in your own information and then boom, there you go. You have your own podcast pitch that people will, or hosts, sorry, will have an enthusiastic yes for. So again, that's a free download at www.theperfectpodcastpitch.com. Love it. That's amazing. And I imagine you're on social media as well, or maybe not because you don't like Instagram. (laughs) Like I said, I love to scroll through it and I'll post the occasional content, but for anyone who wants to hang with me on Instagram, which, you know, I try and be a little more on top of, you can follow me at Lisa Simone Richards. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I think I need to talk to you. I need to find out what you're all about because I know that you can help me too. Thanks so much, Rebecca. It's always so much fun to come and share on a show that I genuinely enjoy listening to. So it's been so much fun, kind of like starstruck to have this conversation with you today. Likewise. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Lisa. It's always refreshing to get a different take on publicity. And I know I've had a few episodes, only a couple actually, where I've talked about this. Um, I have talked in the past about working with publicists. um, And we've had people come on who are publicists who share ways that you can get yourself featured. But Lisa really comes at it with a different perspective. And I I love the ABCs. I think that's amazing. Um, You know, you need a little bit of all three. It's not just about having the credibility and getting published, you know, then it's about the awareness and the buzz. And I love, love, love that. Um, Anyhow, if you guys really like this episode, let me know. Please share it with a friend. And of course, we always appreciate when you leave us a nice review in iTunes so we can grow the podcast and get in front of more designers to help them grow their business. Have a really great day.